All right, everyone, welcome to the Hoodie Community Sync for April. Uh, my name is Nadine, and I'm going to go ahead and start with sharing uh, the agenda with you. So we're going to go over some quick updates with the Hoodie community. And then from there, we're going to do a couple of deep dives. One, we're going to start off with graph queries on Apache Hoodie by Puppy Graph, and we have Waymo joining us today. And then when they get to their uh, sections, we'll, they'll do an intro. And then finally, we have uh, Sakith and Yogesh here on their deep dive with setting Uber's transactional data lake in motion with incremental ETL using Apache Hoodie. Um, so if you guys have not read their recent blog, I'll post that in the chat as well, but it was a really excellent blog on um, building incremental pipelines and they'll go over it more once they get to their sections. So for the community stats and updates, uh, we've had over 118 pull requests, um, over 87 open pull requests, and we've closed 42 issues. I know um, with my weekly syncs with the community, we've been working really hard on triaging PR issues, closing PR issues, and I'm also working on getting um, temp different temperatures on what type of docs we should update and where we can improve that as well. So um, that's coming and we're working really hard on that. On project updates and upcoming releases, we have RFC 65, which is uh, basically how to delete partitions at some cadence. Um, and then for the roadmap, we're actively working on you know, 12.x or 13.x uh, uh, minor releases and minor bug fixes as well. Um, and then we'll uh, work on updating the community roadmap on the hoodie side as well. So without, um, and if you guys uh, want to uh, join the Hudi community, or this is your first time joining. Um, we have our Slack channel. Me and other team members try to get to every post that we see and also do follow ups. And if you use the Hudi repo and you love it, please give us a GitHub star as well. Um, and then we have a QR code too, if you want to scan that and join the Hudi Slack. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pass it to Waymo. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nadi. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Yeah, it's a big honor for us to have an opportunity to uh, share our project uh, uh, to the Hudi community. I think uh, uh, Hudi is a wonderful project and enable that uh, the graph uh, uh, analysis can be seamlessly run on the same copy of data as SQL. And uh, so, and uh, we ho also hope that we can enrich the ecosystem to help uh, the Hudi community have a uh, uh, another ability to do the data analytic. And uh, we call ourselves uh, Puppy Graph, is a graph analytic engine for all your data. Uh, it's not uh, just another graph database. Uh, this is our team. I was working at uh, Google F1, which is a unified SQL query engine inside Google. It support basically all the data format and the data source inside Google. If uh, someone from Google want to write SQL to do data analysis, uh, probably uh, he or she is using the R product. And uh, before that, I was a research scientist at the Telegraph working on the graph query engine and the query language. And definitely my roommate and also the co-founder, he worked at uh, LinkedIn. And uh, Sam is uh, our BD. And uh, Wang Fan and Lei are also all good, fr uh, good friends and uh, we know each other for 10 years and uh, uh, they are working on data pipeline in different uh, uh, internet company. And then Peng Wang is our uh, chief scientist. And uh, uh, our vision is that uh, Data Lake will be the center of uh, data analysis in the next couple of years. And uh, different tools like uh, SQL Query Engine, uh, data science tools, machine learning tools will work uh, uh, seamlessly with uh, Data Lake, since uh, uh, by Data Lake, uh, others' output can be our input, and our input can be <coughs> our output. Uh, by doing this, it's kind of like uh, the bus of uh, the computer architecture. 
uh, before that, each two devices need to talk with each other. But now, uh, all the other tools can directly talk with uh, data lake and write the result back to data lake, then form a super long data pipeline. And uh, our target is to be a Trino or Presto of graph, since uh, the SQL support is uh, very well now at uh, data lake. And, uh, uh, but it seems that no one is working on the graph part and we want to be the uh, core engine for the graph. And by doing that, uh, the main benefit is that uh, the user don't need to do ETL uh, or data duplication for a graph. One copy of data, which in column-based storage, can serve both SQL query engine and also for the graph query. And uh, when I was in Telegraph, actually, I engaged with a lot of customer. Uh, I think the problem is that uh, when a user select the database, it's mostly like to be a SQL database and it has a low chance to be a graph database. But a lot of customers see the values in graph analysis, but not the graph data operations. Uh, for example, uh, they want to do some uh, multiple traverse which is uh, with a uh, complex query. And uh, I think uh, for this customer, actually they really want is uh, a graph data warehouse or data lake house, not a graph database. Uh, but uh, I think uh, mo uh, most of the graph product claim they are graph database. So it's kind of a painful like uh, use MySQL to da do data analysis. And uh, we want to be the first uh, product to satisfy this requirement for just uh, data analysis. And for SQL world is obviously different products for different purpose. Like uh, if user want to do the update, like an and update, they use MySQL or Cockroach DB or some other product, uh, which is a database. But uh, for the data analysis, they will use data warehouse like Snowflake or data lake like uh, Trino <coughs> or Presto on top of Hoodie. Uh, but for the graph, uh, almost all the products are graph database, and we want to uh, be the query engine of uh, the graph data lake, for example, Hoodie. And why graph? Uh, we think that different use cases require different uh, data models. Uh, of course, the SQL is the most uh, relational, uh, sorry, the relational database is the most popular model and uh, supported by SQL. But uh, also there are some others like a KVL store, document DB, and uh, graph database. And uh, there are a bunch of uh, use cases can be addressed uh, easier uh, by the graph model, like uh, cybersecurity, uh, fraud detection, cybersecurity, and uh, blockchain. Uh, they have some uh, common uh, features like uh, the data nature is to be a graph and it's easier to uh, think in graph and uh, query as a graph. And uh, our product uh, is uh, trying to address uh, this kind of uh, use case. And we have some uh, uh, advantage than the other product like uh, low latency and uh, it's fast and scalable. Since the hoodie itself is uh, very scalable, almost uh, there is no limitation for the data side. And our query engine is uh, also distributed and uh, uh, have some other uh, advanced technology like uh, eva vectorized evaluation and uh, multi-thread uh, processing, so which make it uh, faster and uh, low latency for complex query like uh, even 10 hops queries. And we also support different uh, data source. Uh, that is the leverage by the Hoodie technique since uh, Hoodie support different uh, data source. And we also support different query language uh, on graph like uh, Gremlin and Cypher. And uh, we, of course, since uh, since we are on top of Hoodie, so we are uh, open lakehouse architecture can work smoothly with other products. For example, if someone wants to do graph embedding, uh, uh, the users can use us uh, and generate some uh, vectors, and the vectors can directly write back to Hoodie. And, uh, the other machine learning tools can uh, connect to Hoodie and do the data training instead of uh, uh, some maybe uh, 
uh, if we generate some CSV file, which will be super big, and uh, we need to handle how to dis uh, make sharded it and uh, how to uh, load the, the multiple data uh, data file to the machine learning tools. But with Hoodie, it's super easy. We don't need to handle about uh, the distribution part again. And uh, since uh, all you guys are experts uh, for Lakehouse, so we can just uh, skip this slide about why uh, uh, data lake is uh, better than the traditional data analysis uh, architecture. And uh, this is our architecture. Uh, we support different query language and have a different server for different uh, and different client. And uh, for different language, actually, we are trying to generate a unified logical plan. And uh, then for different uh, storage, we generate different uh, physical plan to optimize the performance. And uh, uh, based on experience uh, in God, uh, engagement with our customer, no one wants to uh, load the data. So they just want to keep uh, their data as it is. And uh, by doing this, we have uh, uh, we are lake house architecture, cloud native, peak performance, and no data replication. And we don't need to maintain another copy of data and to see whether uh, it's uh, synced with the ground truth or not, since uh, the data is just uh, in Hudi, and Hudi already handle all these features like uh, data replication and uh, whether it is synced <clears throat> with the data source and uh, also about uh, the distribution. Uh, all this part has been addressed by Hudi. So we just uh, leverage this uh, advantage. Oh, and uh, since currently the common architecture for the graph user is that the ETL data lake, uh, data from data lake to a uh, graph database and then run graph query, which we think that is a kind of uh, uh, doesn't make sense since uh, we think that the data lake will be, should be the de uh, destination of all the other ETL jobs. It's, can, uh, it's weird to ETL, job, ETL the data from data lake to some database, which is, uh, I think, uh, is kind of a re uh, reverse uh, direction. Uh, but uh, uh, our architecture is that uh, all the data, one copy of data in data lake, and uh, if user want to run <coughs> SQL query, they can query it by SQL query engine. If the user want to run graph query, they can use the puppy graph as their graph query engine. Of course, we can use be used as a data warehouse, but our ideal case is that we are on top of a data lake, and uh, user can directly query their uh, existing data without any ETL or data migration. And uh, this is the, the solution without the graph. There are a bunch of ETL to the graph database. And for different query language, they need to have a different product. But uh, with us, the architecture will be pretty simple. Uh, no more ETL they drop from uh, data lake to a uh, graph database anymore. And uh, we also published our uh, product at the AWS Marketplace. And this is how we connect to Hoodie. Uh, first, uh, we use uh, uh, Spark QL, uh, SQL to set up a Hoodie server and insert uh, two lines of uh, example data. One is the person, another is the referral. And then we create a JSON file, uh, which is the logical schema of the graph and also have a mapping from the logical schema to the physical tables uh, inside Hoodie. For example, here we uh, specify the type of the uh, catalogs are Hoodie and uh, uh, the URL of the Hyperman store is uh, uh, like this. And then we just need a mapping from vertices, for example, uh, the per the type vertex type is a person, and then uh, we mapping to the on the HDFF the table person, and the, the table the ID of the vertices is mapping the ID column of uh, the person table, and we also have a, a mapping of the attribute 
uh, which type and which name inside the hoodie. And we also have another, oh, sorry, another mapping is the uh, edges type, uh, the edge types. For example, the nose types of edges, we need to mapping the ID to the uh, column of referral ID of a table referral. And uh, we also need to point out which is column is uh, from and which column is to. And after that, uh, we will have a mapping from uh, the add type to an add table. And after that, we can directly run the graph query like uh, uh, Gremlin or Cypher. For this, uh, for this example, is a uh, Gremlin uh, is a Gremlin query. Uh, we traverse uh, from person and uh, one step out. Uh, along the edge of nodes and then get the values of name is the values, which is uh, uh, like this. Since uh, we have uh, two person and uh, from them traverse out from v v1 to v2, and then the name is the values. And uh, a common question will be, uh, since we don't have an ETL job, what what uh, the performance of uh, us and uh, compare with New4j about three hops, the blue one is the running time and uh, the red one is the all run time. Since uh, hoodie is designed for data analysis and uh, so by take advantage of it, uh, the analysis query performance is uh, better uh, than the database since uh, the database is the role based and uh, uh, when we traverse from it, and especially there is a, a lot of attributes for each vertex and edges, it will be much slower than the analysis job we do it on hoodie. And on the right side is uh, about telegraph. Since telegraph claim they are the only one can run 10 hop query, so we compare the performance with them. Yeah. And uh, that's all for my today's. Uh, presentation and uh, do you guys have any questions? Uh, yeah. Hi, I have a question. Yeah, uh, can I go back to the architecture slide? And then the qu query, so you mentioned that uh, you're also generating uh, logical and physical plans, right? The puppy graph query engine. Yeah. Um, so uh, are you uh, uh, doing some kind of code gen or using uh, pre-compiled uh, primitives to uh, generate these plans? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, since uh, uh, we are on the same layer of uh, uh, Presto, which means uh, uh, if SQL come to a SQL query engine like a Trino, and then it uh, scan the finally it will scan the table of uh, Hoodie, right? And uh, we are on the same level. And if a uh, uh, graph query come here, and then we will generate some logical plan, and then finally we will have some uh, operations how to scan the table of Hoodie, and based on the different query we. Uh, there are so some also some uh, uh, similar strategy of SQL like uh, push filter down or something else. But uh, there are also some uh, uh, specific strategy for the graph query. So it's a uh, kind of uh, different than the SQL query engine, but uh, uh, on the same level, on the same layer uh, layer of the system. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah, so my next follow-up question, it's related to what uh, someone has pinged, uh, Bo has pinged in the chat. So does it take advantage of uh, uh, some features of Hoodie, um, such as uh, column stats, uh, which can help in uh, data skipping? Uh, of course, if we can build some uh, index on Hoodie, it will benefit the performance, especially for the from column and the to column. And uh, we also 
benefits that uh, we are benefited by the hoodies. Uh, since, uh, uh, but currently we don't have a, uh, uh, most time we don't want to update by ourselves since we don't want to maintain the data by ourselves. And uh, since uh, Woody have a data updating uh, technique to make it uh, uh, affect the most real time uh, uh, updates. And uh, also uh, we are working on some other feature like uh, time travel, but uh, currently we haven't exposed to our interface yet. We are testing it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, actually, can you go back to, to that slide that compares your performance to Neo4j yeah. and Tiger Graph? Yeah. yeah, I just want to. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, in this case, when you compare your performance to Neo4j, right, we're talking about mm -hmm. 100x faster also. Also, you 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 two what two x faster than Tiger Graph? My question is, where does that performance gain come come from? Do you scan less data, or do you use a better query optimizer or something? Uh yeah, and uh, firstly that uh, uh since uh, uh New Forge is a uh, column based uh, storage and uh, it's mainly focus on insert uh, edge and uh, insert and vertex or edge. And uh, by doing this, uh, if they have a uh, multiple attribute, you have to load the entire rows into the memory, and this is uh, one of the benefits. Another is that uh, since uh, uh there. Uh, when they want to, they travel their neighbors, so it's uh, the address are stored as a double linked list. And mm. then if there is a hub node, it will be slow. But uh, for us, uh, you can imagine that uh, scan a uh, hoodie table actually, uh, uh, when it's an index, uh, we don't have to, it's not OD, it's more like, uh, uh, between OD and O O1. So it, so it will be faster when the, there is a half node. You can see that uh, the blue one, uh, the uh, X is, uh, the X axis is a different source. We start from 100 vertices as a data source and then traverse three hops. And when there is a half node, it will be super slow. I have another question. Which versions of Hoodie is it compatible with PuppyGraph? Uh, let me see. It's 2.12 and up? Yeah, yeah. OK. Any other questions for Waymo? All right, we'll pass it to uh, Sakath and Yogesh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Cool. Uh, can I share my screen, Waymo? Yeah. Awesome, thanks. Uh, just making sure everyone can see my screen. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Socket. I'm a software engineer on the data transformation platform team at Uber. And here with me today is Yogesh, who is a senior engineer on the delivery data solutions team. And we're here to talk about how we brought the incremental ETL model to derive data sets at Uber. <clears throat> so a little bit of agenda of what we're going to go through today is uh, a background of the problem and motivation of why we decided to move towards the incremental model. Um, go over the incremental ETL processing primitives and the lakehouse architecture. We also want to talk about the feature highlights that Hoodie and Delta Streamer support that we leveraged in our model. Um, we're going to go over how to actually use this uh, ETL model to spin up a data pipeline, uh, talk about different types of joins, uh, read and write operations. 
Um, and then we're going to do a deep dive on a couple of use cases um, that we um, converted to from batch processing to incremental processing. Uh, and finally, we're going to talk a little bit about observability, alerting, and uh, the performance improvements that we saw. So jumping right in, uh, to give a background of how ETLs were written at Uber prior to this project, um, you can take a look at the following diagram. As you can see, we capture updates from data streams, uh, such as Kafka in our case, and incrementally apply these updates to raw hoodie data sets um, using upsearch in our data lake. Um, but however, for our derived data models, we were relying on batch processing every six to 10 hours and populating our downstream data sets by performing a traditional end day look back scan on the upstream raw data sets, uh, recomputing the necessary data and reloading um, our data downstream. So this was inefficient and complicated for a couple of reasons. One is we had no idea what partitions are, ch are changed or updated upstream. So we needed to do a look back of either you know, 7, 30, or 90 days, depending on the business requirements, and scan the entire range of partitions from the upstream data set. Um, as you can imagine, late arriving data in this case is a nightmare because updates can span sometimes several weeks or even months of older partitions. And if the look back window of our scan on read is too small, these older updates would not be captured and our data would remain inconsistent and incomplete in our downstream data sets. Um, and the second reason, uh, second complication is we have no, we had no way to update only the change records in the downstream data set. So we use uh, traditionally a full outer join, uh, merge the change records with the existing records, and then rewrote the entire partition in case of a fact table or the entire data set for non-partition tables such as dimension tables. So for like an example dimension table, um, such as a driver dimension, our data set would contain hundreds of millions of drivers, um, which would mean hundreds of millions of records, but only say a few hundred thousand uh, drivers may have in some updates uh, that we needed to process every single day. But due to a lack of the incremental primitives, we would have to rewrite all 100 million records on this data set on every single ETL run. And as you can imagine, that gets uh, that processing is super slow, uh, super resource uh, exhaustive, um, and also super expensive. On the other hand, um, stream processing is super fast and efficient. So by using watermarks, stream processors can easily consume incremental data uh, from the upstream data streams. And uh, the idea was to basically bring the streaming model onto our batch data stack, which um, would efficiently capture all the updates and only the updates from upstream and do a targeted update to only the affected uh, records in our downstream data set. So incremental ETL processing helped us achieve near real-time results, which basically means it's not as fast as real-time, but it's significantly faster than batch processing. Uh, how we achieved this with Hoodie, uh, we used two uh, primitives, uh, the first one being incremental pull, which basically uses uh, a checkpoint to um, capture only the incremental data from our upstream and um, avoids the costly full scans of tables. Uh, and the second primitive being upsert, which um, modifies process results in order partitions and is able to update only those uh, and touch only those parquet files which contain the updates required. So over here, you can kind of see a side-by-side -side comparison of how we're doing things in the past versus how we're doing things right now. And as I explained, for batch processing, we would scan the last end partitions, um, do a full uh, scan of the previous version of the table and merge the updates and write the new update to our final table. Whereas with incremental processing, we're able to incrementally fetch new data without scanning entire partitions doing the joins and transformations as necessary and updating uh, records on the target table directly only for the records that have changed without touching the existing records. So uh, this is a little bit about the Lakehouse architecture. Um, this piece, as you as I explained before, was fundamentally already in place at Uber, so where we were capturing changes from Kafka and doing upsearch to our raw hoodie data sets. Um, and we decided to extend this to our derived data sets by creating uh, a framework which basically calls Hoodie's Delta Streamer, um, where we do SQL based transformations while incrementally pulling data, change data from our upstream, joining with our other upstream dependencies, such as other dimensions, facts, or other raw data sets, and doing an upsert to our final table. So this, uh, in fact, enables our data consumers downstream to leverage Delta Streamer again and consume updates incrementally from our derived data sets um, so they can, in a similar fashion, 
consume incremental updates and do upsearch on their uh, further downstream uh, data pipelines. So here are some uh, feature highlights from Hoodie that uh, I wanted to highlight that we were using uh, Uber. I think I've already gone through incremental reads and upsearches. Uh, in some cases where we want to reduce write amplification, we also have merge on read tables uh, being explored here. Uh, and Hoodie also offers various uh, indexing mechanisms that help us provide uh, fast lookups on records. Uh, these indexing mechanisms provide a one-to-one -one mapping of record or Hoodie key to uh, the actual Parquet file, so we can quickly uh, update and touch only those files. Um, we are also leveraging Hoodie clustering at Uber to basically uh, sort or reorganize the data um, based on highly queried columns. Uh, so a lot of our data sets um, and our consumers consume a specific set of columns from our derived data sets uh, more often than others. So we have observed that if we perform Hoodie clustering operations on those specific columns, um, we have an improved query performance on query engines to basically decrease the number of files being uh, read on each uh, for each query. Uh, with Hoodie's concurrency control, we're able to run uh, parallel ingestion and backflow pipelines. Um, and of course, with uh, since Hoodie maintains an active commit timeline, if there's any if there's a case any time at which there's data corruption in any of our data sets, we're able to roll back that bad commit and go quickly rewind to the previous stable version, which decreases incident mitigation time. Uh, coming to Delta Streamer, um, we can read incrementally from multiple sources. Uh, we primarily, for our derived data sets, read from our upstream raw data sets, so which would be a hoodie incremental source. Um, but for backflow scenarios where we know exactly which partitions we want to read upstream, we also leverage the Spark SQL source. Um, and to further decrease uh, latency and freshness, we can tap into Kafka directly and read incrementally from Kafka streams. Uh, we have various transformers uh, that we use primarily since our data engineers are comfortable with SQL. We use a Spark SQL based transformer, um, which transforms the incremental data, performs various joins required. And uh, data validation uh, is very crucial at Uber. So we want to make sure that we're never publishing any bad data uh, to our data sets. So we have Spark SQL based uh, preload data quality checks. We're leveraging the Hoodie pre commit validators to ensure that we have non-null checks, uh, uniqueness checks, and any other custom checks in place before we actually uh, publish the commit. I think I already went over concurrency control. Um, and yeah, so um, with Hoodie's incremental read, we don't have to worry about the window on which we're looking back on our raw data tables. Um, thereby, we can capture any updates that come from any partition um, while leveraging Dr. Streamer. And with this, we're able to achieve 100% completeness. Um, and based on the frequency at which uh, users run their pipelines, a lot of data sets can achieve um, really uh, low latency and freshness of sometimes even less than our SLA with respect to upstream. Uh, so how do we use it? So we have uh, Uber uses Piper, which is an internal workflow orchestration tool that is very similar to Apache Airflow. Um, and my team has built a framework uh, called Spark ETL, which basically allows users to deploy pipelines in a config driven manner uh, with three simple files. Uh, the first one being a DDL file, which contains the schema of the data set that they intend to create. Um, a YAML file, which contains all the necessary hoodie configurations and Spark tuning configurations required for the job. And a SQL transformation file, which contains all the business logic and the data transformations required uh, for the downstream data set. So with these three simple files, the DAG is automatically generated by the framework. Uh, as you can see, the first task is uh, the Delta Streamer task, which is uh, doing nothing but calling the Spark application. Um, for more complicated ETL use cases, uh, we also have uh, Hoodie also allows you to pass your own custom uh, Java Spark tra uh, transformer. Uh, basically, to do this uh, it requires three steps. One is to implement the transformer interface. Um, second step is to override the apply method to basically um, have all of your business logic and your custom transformations here. Uh, and you simply pass this transformer class to uh, Delta Streamer, and it'll pick this up and run it. So you can see an example uh, transformation um, class that I've created. It's doing nothing but basically doing some select statements, running some Spark SQL, doing group by aggregations, uh, some joins, um, all of uh, the inbuilt functionality um, provided by JavaSpark data frames. 
so this is um, a big, uh, this is more of a complicated situation when building incremental ETLs is understanding the concept of streaming joins. Previously with uh, only static tables, we were able to do all the different kinds of joins, but when our core uh, data is incremental from our upstream and we are intending to join with other upstream raw data sets or derived data sets that are static, um, we are limited to only these specific types of joins. So if the stream uh, is on the left and static on the right, then we can only do an inner or left outer join and vice versa um, for static data sets joining the stream data sets. So, uh, so let's go over the different types of read and join operations. So if we're doing incremental read on a single source, this is kind of a straightforward pull from upstream and um, basically we can use Hoodie's incremental reader and upsert to our target table. If we want to incrementally read from one table and join with other multiple raw data sets, we use Hoodie's incremental reader on the main table and do a left outer join, as I explained in the previous slide, on the other raw data tables with the T minus 24 uh, hour look back for these raw data sets. So we have a service at Uber um, called Night's Watch, which is basically a completeness monitoring as a service. So before our ETL runs, we are able to ensure that these other raw data tables have a freshness SLA of less than 12 hours which uh, essentially solves the late arriving data problem for our joins. Uh, with the case of incremental read and joining with multiple other derived tables, uh, we do an incremental read on the main table like before and perform a left outer join on the other derived tables. And because we are fetching incrementally, we're able to do a join only on the affected and required partitions on the other derived tables as well. And for backfills, uh, we do a snapshot read on single or multiple tables. So in backfill use cases, we generally know that what data um, and what partitions we generally want to backfill for. So we simply do a scan uh, based on the ETL metadata start and end dates um, to get that data, transform it, and then write it into our final uh, hoodie data sets. Uh, similarly for writes, for partition tables, we use upsert to apply incremental updates. For backfill use cases and cases where we want to overwrite the entire partitions, we use insert overwrites. Uh, and for non-incremental columns, we're exploring using targeted merge and update state statements uh, that's offered in Hoodie 10. For non-partition tables, again, we use upsert to apply the incremental updates, and we use insert overwrite when we need to join incremental rows uh, and do a full outer join on uh, the target table to update both the incremental and the non-incremental columns in cases where we see data quality issues on the non-incremental columns. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and dive into uh, use case one, which uh, is related to driver earnings. Uh, so let's imagine that we have a data set uh, which contains uh, a daily earnings aggregate for a, a specific driver, which basically combines um, an earnings event would, would be defined as uh, a trip that the driver took. Um, combined with any incentives uh, that the driver has received for completing that trip. Um, an example of that would be a tip uh, or other incentives. Um, so let's assume that the driver finished uh, a trip on Monday and earned $10. And on Tuesday, he completed another trip, earned $8, but got a $1 uh, tip on Tuesday for the trip that he took on Monday. So as you can imagine, there's uh, many late arriving earning data stats. So if you look at this graph here, we can see that on, the, on May 10th, we received earnings updates from partitions dating back to December and January. Um, and if the windows uh, that we're doing a full scan on previously weren't large enough, we would not be able to capture these updates and they would go missing in our downstream data sets. So if here you can see the different granularities of aggregation and the number of rows uh, per partition. Uh, so for weekly and daily, uh, what we did in the past was do a full load of the last 91 days. Um, and this was a very time resource uh, and resource exhaustive um, process because we were doing a full scan of 90 days on every ETL run. And for more granular aggregation types like hourly or minutely, it's, it would simply be too large uh, for us to do a 90 lay look back. Um, we'd hit all sorts of memory um, and resource issues. So again, to reiterate full load, it's easy to implement. Uh, because over here, uh, as I mentioned, we're doing a 90 day look back. We are doing simple joins to fetch um, the data. But if there's any updates to data past the window, in our case, maybe 91 days or more, those, those updates would be lost. 
Uh, whereas with incremental load uh, with Hoodie, we're able to capture all the updates um, from our upstream table and apply them to our downstream data set. So uh, it's easier to implement um, that it's not real time, but it's close. So the wins that we've seen um, with this use case is, of course, uh, as I mentioned about the late data arriving problem, uh, this was no longer the case when we use Hoodie's Delta Streamer. So we achieved 100% data accuracy uh, and no updates are lost even for trips that are a year old and maybe if updates are coming to those trips. Uh, we're able to process less data on each run. Um, before we were doing weekly aggregation with full road, uh, full load, um, which took around four to five hours. But now uh, with incremental processing, it takes takes around forty five minutes, and this can also be improved uh, with uh, by tuning like Spark parameters. Freshness, um, we have the potential to bring down the freshness SLA from thirty one hours, which which is what was previously, to uh, down to a couple of hours, depending on how frequently we run our pipeline. Um, and basically this will unlock earnings features closer to real time. Uh, and finally, I think the biggest thing is uh, Lake House based incremental ETLs are far cheaper. Uh, we've observed around 50% uh, decrease in job costs than with comparison to the old school batch pipelines. At this point, I'm gonna hand it off to Yogesh um, and he will talk about uh, the next use case. Yeah, oh, let me just share my screen. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, let me know if my screen is visible. Yeah. Cool. Uh, thanks, Aket. Uh, I'll just quickly uh, cover how we leveraged uh, Lakehouse ETL solution for, to improve basically uh, the quality and reliability of our main data sets. So in uh, Uber, uh, we have uh, Uber Eats uh, already delivered and we have uh, Lot of data sets at uh, multiple levels of granularity. So we have uh, two basically model menu data. We have data sets at menu level, at section level, at item, and at modifier groups and pattern level. And the problem is we have to basically uh, ingest the data in these data sets sequentially because all of these data sets are dependent on each other. So first we have to basically uh, ingest data in base table, and then uh, other data sets can be ingested sequentially. And uh, there are a few other things. Uh, uh, that we have to consider. The first one is uh, there would be frequent updates uh, to main data by the merchants. And the second one is uh, the requirement was to basically bring down uh, the SLA of these data sets to nearly uh, 10 hours because these are uh, year on model data sets. Uh, the other thing is uh, though uh, there are uh, frequent updates from the merchants for the main data, if we consider the overall main data, then only fraction of main data changes per day. So if you just see this graph, then for every day, uh, only four to 5% of data is changing as compared to uh, total 100% of data. So we have around uh, 11 million records, but only uh, 400 to 500 million records changes per day. Uh, this is uh, in the architecture uh, before uh, leveraging the lake of retail solution. So earlier uh, we used to have one uh, upstream uh, data sets for uh, main data. And then every time uh, we basically uh, capture the previous partition from the upstream table, then join uh, that partition using full auto join, join that partition with the uh, menu base table uh, and bring full scan and merge to come up with the newer version of uh, menu base data. And then ingest that data in uh, kind of base table. And uh, from uh, this base, uh, we basically creates new tables sequentially. And for every downstream table, we're basically recreating that table. Basically we are doing 100% processing in each run. And uh, since this uh, was a sequential process uh, and we were processing 100% of our data in each run, it was taking nearly uh, 12 to 13 hours for the entire exhibition. And uh, that was one of the reasons uh, we were not able to bring down the SLA to 10 hours. The second one was uh, the strategy. Here we are using the full load strategy and that was the main re uh, reason uh, for the bottleneck of our main pipelines. But with Lake House retail solution uh, and the other, like the main thing is since the data is change, like only 5% change, 5% of data changes per day, incremental load uh, really helped us a lot because we are only capturing the 5% of data from the upstream. And we are just directly doing the upsets on menu based data since uh, Hoodie itself can uh, do the merging and all that stuff. Then once we have the uh, base data, then we are just uh, capturing the up, uh, 
upsets or basically capturing the latest change data in MinoBase. And we are just processing that data in the downstream table. So here uh, in each downstream uh, table, uh, we'll be just processing the 5% of data each time. So these uh, effectively help us to reduce the overall execution time of min our menu pipeline from uh, nearly 12 to 13 hours to less than four hours. And since our, our total execution time is now uh, within uh, 10 hours, we, we basically changed our frequency to six hours and we were able to achieve our uh, SLA of 10 hours. So these are a uh, few of the wins. The first one is again the efficiency one. Earlier our pipeline used to take uh, 12 hours, but with uh, incremental ATL, uh, it is it's taking four hours. And overall resource usage was also reduced by 60%. Or uh, uh, in terms of uh, the cost effectiveness, uh, it is very cheaper because earlier we used to uh, process 11 billion records per run, but with lack of ATL, we are just processing uh, around four to five percent of data, and it is far cheaper. Around like we have observed 75% improvements uh, in terms of cost. In terms of SLA, uh, now our SLA is uh, eight hours, uh, we have seen around 75% um, improvements in SLA, and this can be further improved. And the last one is accuracy. So earlier we were only uh, picking up the latest partition from the upstream table because uh, we have to process a lot of data and that's why uh, we were ignoring the uh, late arriving data in the upstream tables. But with Hoodie, uh, since it captures the late arriving data as well, so we achieved 100% data accuracy. So uh, now we don't have any updates, uh, which can be lost. Yeah, uh, thank you. With this, I'll hand over to Saket uh, for the next uh, slides. Thanks, Yogesh. Cool. Um, so with that, we're going to talk a little bit about observability and performance improvements. So uh, as you can see, we are emitting specific metrics from Delta Streamer, which captures information about the commit and the progress of data capture from upstream to downstream. So from this uh, Grafana dashboard, you can see the number of commits that are in progress with each ETL run and the commits that we are yet to process from upstream. So with this, we can reduce the time to detect potential freshness failures or ETL failures. If we see a divergence in this graph, we can we have set up or in the process of setting up alerts uh, based on these metrics. Uh, we also have improved uh, observability around data loads and volumes. Um, so basically around the number of total records that have been updated and ins or versus inserted uh, without needing to manually uh, query uh, our data set. Uh, coming to performance improvements um, with, as you can see across the board, we have an average of around 50% improvement um, with respect to vCores memory uh, cost and also significant improvements with respect to the time it takes for our ETL processes to run. Um, yeah, um, with that, finally, want to give a huge shout out to Vinod Govindarajan, who uh, was an ex-engineer uh, at Uber, who brought this idea to life uh, and to production at Uber, uh, and the rest of the team that have continued to work and support the framework uh, from both the hoodie side and the data transformation platform side, uh, and also to all of our customers that have onboarded to Lakehouse CTO, uh, including Yogesh and his team uh, and, and others as well. And yeah, that's um, that's it for us today. So we can take any questions. I have one question. What were um, you talked about a lot of like the cost efficiencies? Mm -hmm. uh, you want to go back to that slide? I think. Um, is it this one? Uh, yeah. Or go. Up. I was like one of the single slides that you had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We achieved yeah hundred percent data accuracy. So, um, what were some of the ways that you were able to do this? Like, what, I guess you have helpful tips for um people in the hoodie community who also want to achieve this. Yeah, so I think uh, the biggest problem, as I explained, was uh, with do it when with respect to traditional batch processing, uh, we traditionally did an end date look back based on the business requirement of our ETLs. So we would look back maybe th three, five, or even thirty days in some cases, um, and scan the upstream tables. But we would thereby be losing the updates on the regular ingestion runs when uh, data updates come to partitions that are outside of this look back window. Uh, but with incremental read and uh, Dr. Schlieber, we're able to capture 
all of the updates from upstream and apply those changes to our downstream data set, which we were not able to do before, unless and until we manually went back and created backfills for those specific partitions. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, I have, I have one question. Uh, if you go to the, the observability commit slide. Yep. Yeah, here, you know. So what exactly this metric, you know, uh, you said, you know, it's available in Delta Streamer, right? Uh, yeah, so these metrics uh, uh, we've added inside uh, Uber's version of Hoodie. Um, so basically, oh, okay. we're, um, yeah, I, th I think we're in the process of trying to push this to open source as well. But uh, basically, it captures information on each uh, time Delta Streamer is called on based on how many commits it's consuming from the upstream source and how many commits uh, we are yet to process um, from the upstream source as well. So if we see like a huge divergence or an increase yeah. in lag from upstream, that's when we know that there's something going wrong and we need to go back and look at our retail process and see what's going wrong and fix it. Okay, so the first one, I think, let's say the row table and second is a derived table graph, right? Okay, got it. Yeah, so both of these graphs are uh, respect to the same upstream table. Uh, this is just with respect to the number of commits that are in progress and that are being read with each run. And this is basically telling us about the lag that we're yet to process. Uh -huh. okay, 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 yeah, okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining the Community Sync. We'll right. have another one in May. Um, does someone have a question? Oh, sorry, I thought I heard something. Um, and I hope to see you in next month's Community Sync. If you have any more questions, please post them in the community Slack channel and I'll see you next month. And thanks to our presenters uh, for this Community Sync and taking time to present to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. See Bye -bye. You.